Yay! That was perfectly in sync. I've well been done. practicing on my own. <laughs> You've just been sitting back <laughs> yeah. here, like, practicing. Yay! Yay! <laughs> uh, what is up, everybody? Welcome to Ginger Runner Live, episode number 238. Excited about tonight's show because our guests, David and Megan Roach, uh, not only are incredible coaches, uh, they coach both Kim and myself, but they're amazing athletes. Uh, they're also authors. Tonight, we're going to talk about their new book. Um, but we're in the midst of the holiday season. And so I was really excited to talk to them about how do we get through the holidays, keeping our strength, keeping our endurance, training, balancing our schedule. I mean, we're in this time that gets so chaotic and it's so easy to either let workouts slip or long run slip. And uh, I want to talk to them about keeping motivated and getting through the holiday season efficiently. So I'm excited about tonight's show. I am too. Nice. People in chat room are excited about your hair. And yours. We both have hair tonight. <laughs> Normally, they're beanies or hats. We got our hair hats. cut. <laughs> I feel like it's been months, but that's yeah. exactly what the viewers and listeners want uh, is Talk haircuts. about our... Yes. So excited. So ex- <laughs> Half the show will be about us talking about haircuts, and then we'll introduce David and Megan Roach. Um, <laughs> welcome, everybody. Sit back, relax, get ready. Ginger Runner Live begins now. Yay! Uh, what is up, everybody? Welcome to Ginger Runner Live, episode number 238. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy Mondays to spend a little bit of it with us. Um, excited about tonight's show. Our guests are fre- frequent guests of Ginger Runner Live. They're mm-hmm. professionals in the realm of coaching uh, runners as well as athletes themselves, uh, elite athletes. And they're just very knowledgeable. Um, they come from uh, a very educated background when it comes to the sport and how to allow our bodies to do more. Uh, I'm just excited to have them on. David and Megan Roach are going to be joining us on tonight's episode. And possible special guest. Almost guaranteed Addie special Roach. guest. Yeah, Addie Roach will be joining us. We love our running pups, and uh, Addie is no exception. We're going to talk to them tonight about training through the holiday season. Uh, we just had Thanksgiving. I'm still digesting. Thankful. Thankful. Yes, yeah, still thankful. <laughs> Uh, But we're going into this next month, two months of holidays, binging, uh, family gatherings, and just balancing training and getting out there and training properly, uh, picking your races for 2019. That's a big common thing. There's a lot that goes on in these two months that I think people, uh, it's stressful. So I I thought bringing these two individuals on would be a wonderful way to help answer your questions and maybe get you a little bit of additional advice to help guide you through the holiday season. Uh, before we, of course, introduce our guests, I am your host, and I am joined by... Hi, guys. My name is Kim, and as always, I will be manning, womaning the chat room. Um, if you guys have questions, we are, of course, live, so please pop your questions into the chat room. We'll be pulling them throughout the hour. Uh, we are able to do this show because of our wonderful Patreon supporters. If you are not a Patreon supporter, please consider it for as little as a dollar a month. You help make Ginger Runner Live happen uh, week after week, month after month. Uh, three individuals in particular at that top tier help make this show uh, just what it is, our full-time job. So we like to shout them out at the beginning of every show, uh, give them a big thank you, and especially now during the holidays. It's very important for us to make sure they know how thankful we are. So Chris Lee, uh, Chris is in Hong Kong. He and his organization, Trailblazer, they showcase all the local trails in Hong Kong. It's a great community there. He just uh, is currently training and prepping for a big 100-kilometer race that goes through Hong Kong. They just finished the Can Run, which is a charity event that he does there. A uh, wonderful person. And if you find yourself in the Hong Kong area or running an event there or any of that sort of thing, check out Trailblazer. He and his uh, crew are awesome. Rick Bjarnison and his team at CheekyMonkeyMedia.ca. They're a web design company. He himself is an ultra runner. He's training next year. Pretty excited about this. We just He and I just talked the other day. And he's got Sinister 7, Fat Dog 120, Plus a couple of other dazzling races on his calendar next so, year. like only the hardest races in Canada. Yeah, pretty much the <laughs> hardest races in Canada. He attempted Sinister this year, uh, and he's he's going back for revenge next year. I'm, I'm really excited to kind of follow his journey. Yeah. But they're a web design company. They're redoing the Ginger Runner website. Uh, they're an amazing team of professionals and very talented. So definitely check out cheekymonkeymedia.ca. And finally, our good friend Brian Sands, who's just a wonderful human being, um, ran his first marathon last year, trained and completed his first 50K this summer. Currently training for not only his second 50K, but his first 50 miler next year. Just a, a stand-up dude, obviously in the chat room, 
week after week. Big member of this community. So we really uh, would like to say thank you to him as well. So that's it. Thank you so much for those individuals and all of our Patreon supporters. Uh, we love to have you on board. Now, what? I was just going to say a quick reminder for the Patreon supporters. There is uh, some special goodies up on the Patreon site for you guys right out. now. Um, so just make sure you try and pop over there and have a look. Um, our guests tonight are, they're just, they're a delight. They're wonderful spirits, wonderful people to be around. They're very inspirational. They're very educated and they help guide so many people through the running realm and right. getting, uh, achieving their goals. Uh, they're professional coaches, elite athletes, runners, ultra runners. Uh, they have quite the extensive resumes, but just all around great people and tonight, we're going to ask them all sorts of questions about training during the holidays, upcoming races, choosing that, and their new book, The Happy Runner, that they, I think, I mean, it's been in pre-order, but it is officially shipping I think now. it's shipping now. It's pretty cool. And also, everybody on our Christmas list is getting one. Everyone, <laughs> and everyone has their gifts spoiled. I was also going to say that there's a lot of pressure right now coming from the chat room. Everybody is hoping that David and Megan also got their hair cut this week. Ooh, we're about to find out. Oh. Without further ado, welcome to Ginger Runner Live, episode number 238. Our guests, David and Megan Roach. Yay! Yay. Addie is excited, um, and I'm so glad we're talking about haircuts, because Megan <laughs> just got a, got a buzz. <laughs> Rocking a very short ponytail. It's always in a ponytail, but this time it's very short. Um, and glad we're talking about the holidays because Addie has been getting quite a bit of leftover turkey. So at this point, she's pretty much like half dog, half turkey, and we're like sitting here yeah. trying to hold her up. So <laughs> yeah. this, this is a very appropriate topic for lots tonight. Of, lots of tryptophan in her system right now. A, a half dog, half turkey. Uh, <laughs> I hope that she wasn't on a platter for the family or anything like that. <laughs> That's her style. She gets like half of everything we need. So. <laughs> Literally, yeah. She's had spring rolls and faux noodles, and she just is all about the food. Uh, so first of all, congratulations. The book is available now, of course, on Amazon, and it's, it's shipping. You have actual physical copies now? Yeah, they're all over the place. But um, So here's the book. It's, as, as, as promised, it's a book. Also, <laughs> I don't love the camera, so this is like a prime opportunity for me to just like put this in front of my face. <laughs> All is good in the world, so that's it serves a dual purpose. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, there might be words in here. Time will tell. You have to buy it to find out if there's actually <laughs> content. I, I love that. That's the selling point: is that there might be words in it, or it might just be paper. <laughs> and it's a book. And it is a book. Uh, and might be some Addy Dog pictures in there, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is a hard time because I'm I'm very bad at. Dude, he's terrible at selling books. He's like, eh, it's not for everyone. I'm like, it is for everyone. Everyone <laughs> right. can buy it and love it. <laughs> yeah. At the worst case scenario, it can be like a gift to your worst enemy. Like, if you don't like it. So, wait, Marketing I'm 101. We actually practice. Like, this how you <laughs> I already failed. I love it. Um, I, I kind of want to get to – we've obviously had you on the show before. We've talked a little bit about the book. This is the first time actually seeing it in, in physical form. Uh, but having read the book and knowing a lot of some of the backstory, can you let our audience know why specifically this book? Uh, what is the angle and how can it help multiple people? Because I think for both Kim and myself, um, dealing with different levels of anxiety and other sorts of uh, uh, mental health things – this book couldn't have come at a better time. And uh, I'm just really curious what made you decide to write it. So, I mean, I guess we both took a lot of baggage into running and coaching where, um, you know, we spend a lot of time inside our two ears, like, like everyone else. And I think when we started coaching, we didn't realize just how much that experience was shared. Um, the experience of like, you know, it's not always puppies and unicorns, even though, it, like you can try to push it more in that direction. So mm -hmm. um, basically we saw all these athletes having similar problems and stresses, whether they suffered from severe he mental health issues or not. Um, and we found that that was like the most important part of coaching. So yeah, basically it's trying to help a runner on their path towards unconditional self-acceptance and hopefully laugh a little bit along the way. Um, acknowledging that it's darn near impossible sometimes. 
I think too, in SWAP, we're so lucky. We coach a ton of amazing athletes. And um, along the way, we've gotten to see their stories. And so the book is not about us. I mean, I'm 28, David's 30. We know nothing about the world at all. Um, <laughs> so we've been uh, fortunate to, you know, have the the journey into um, our athletes' lives and also just read a ton. Um, and so both the reading and um, being involved in athletes' lives are what inspired the stories in the book. And so for us, those were meaningful to share just because, like, Amelia Boone, in the book you two are in the book um you know like all these amazing athletes are in the book and so that was important for us yeah I mean the hope the hope would be that like after a person reads it it's kind of like one of those late night conversations you're having with a friend or a podcast with you guys where you finish it and you know you've laughed a little you talked about deep stuff you've maybe cried a little and you feel like you got a big hug and I mean if we can do that for even one person we're really happy and um yeah, so we'll, we'll see. I think Plus, added off the co-authors. So yeah, yeah. That's like hard <laughs> <laughs> parts, yeah. <laughs> I think there's a whole chapter of just bark, bark, right? It's just 17 yeah, yeah. pages caps. of bark, all caps. Uh, did you make the centerfold? I'm I'm the centerfold. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They, they wrote me a special email thought. like, yeah. hey, do you have a photo that can <laughs> fold out? I was like, I got a couple. <laughs> How many copies do you want to sell? And they're like, at least one. I was like, oh, this this will ruin that. <laughs> um, one thing that uh, uh, I took away from it, and I think it's one of the most benef- beneficial things of, of in, I've been open with my dealing with anxiety for years now. On, on this channel, it definitely took, it took more for me to kind of confront it on the channel and be more public and open with it. But I don't regret it for a second uh, dealing or, or addressing my battle with anxiety through my whole life. But one thing that I really took away from the book and talking to both of you individually is just that you give a great sense of that I'm not alone. And that that whole idea of there are other people out there who are dealing with, I mean, you have chapters and paragraphs where you outline, here's what this person felt during this thing. And I'm reading it going, that's like what I feel at certain points. And I'm not saying that the book is specifically for people with anxiety or for like mental illness or any of that sort of thing. But I I found multiple moments of connection to the words based off of experiences from others. Did you find that you have uh, a multitude of athletes that felt the same way when they read the book? Or did you ask people to use their stories or, you know, what was your mindset behind using these stories uh, in the first place? I think it's just the universal nature of the human condition. You know, like we're all on this path that we're not quite sure where we're going, where we came from, or what the goal is. And, you know, a lot of us have decided that we're going to be running along this along this journey. So we're humans that run, not runners that human. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the the side effect of being human is that you have these existential things that you know, you're confronting all the time. And as a runner, you're dealing with that more than most because you're spending a lot of time thinking and and developing and, and all these other things. So basically we wanted to confront that head on and just put it out in the open so that everyone could see like, yeah, whatever you feel, it's okay and you're enough. Whether it is the worst thing and the, like, you know, you have to, you're going through hospitalization things for a really bad thing, or it's just like, sometimes you don't like yourself that much, you know, which is something we all feel. Um, so trying to find that shared human connection within a running life rather than just identifying as runners. And I think the fact that everyone goes through it too is really helpful. So we have stories in there from recreational runners to some of the top professional trail runners and everyone goes through the same exact thing. And I think that's a really important parallel through all the stories. I mean, and then we actually have a chapter specific to mental health issues just because they're so important. And when I was, when we were writing the chapter, I was like, crap, like we were trying to figure out like where the examples were going. And I was like, well, I could be anxiety. I could be depression. <laughs> I could be eating disorder. I could be insomnia. Like yeah. I can also see myself a few times. Yeah, so yeah. Where am I going to go in? And so um, I felt like it was like writing it for us. was also really instructive too. Yeah. It's uh, it's my favorite chapter. It's the one I actually go back to quite often just because I find myself digging my own holes and, and getting caught up in my own shit and then realizing, let me just take a step back and see the bigger picture here for a second. Uh, again, we are live. We have a, a, a lively audience tonight. If you have questions, please drop them into the chat room. Kim's already pulled a couple aside. Let's get to those and then we're going to start talking about 
training through the holidays and stuff. And I feel like we'll Perfect. reference the book multiple times tonight, but let's, let's get started with a live question. Yeah. There's been lots of questions asking, um, is the book going to be available on audible or audiobook form? We are working on that. Um, the answer is not yet. Um, if anyone has any side note, if anyone has any resources in that area, <laughs> we would love to hear about it. But um, so yes, we're working on it. Yeah, our publishers usually doesn't go down that path. Um, but it's very flattering that you might even possibly consider that. Um, if so, we're going to need to make Addie read her own parts. I think about <laughs> I'm, I'm sure if I narrated it, I talk so fast that it could fit like the length. It'd be the book. quickest. Yeah. It'd be like one long run, and the book would be done. <laughs> uh, I people were asking like who's going to voice it and stuff like. Uh, Brian Sands had that question of who's going to be the narrator. Um, James Earl Jones, I'm sure, is available, and I'm yeah. sure he'd be great. <laughs> After doing Mufasa in the new Lion King, I think. Yeah. But he'll probably be on a make time for us. <laughs> hey, we've got this run. I'm in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whatever it takes. James Earl uh, Jones. Addy, I know, yeah. <laughs> Let's get to one more question here. Uh, lots of coaching questions here. Um, Deb Hamberlin in the chat room asks, uh, how do you coach elite athletes differently than mid or back of the pack runners? We don't, um, as weird as that sounds. So to us, we view every athlete as an elite athlete. And I think it all gets back to the nature of being an athlete in the first place. Um, you know, a lot of things lead to finish lines. I mean, genetics being a big one, um, life circumstances being another, background being another. And just because someone has like a confluence of factors that makes them reach the finish line sooner, that doesn't, it's not a value judgment about what they've, you know, about their self-worth, about their worth as a human. And so when it, when it comes to coaching, like our big thing is we're all trying to reach our personal potential. That might be different levels, but to us, it feels the same. It's the same type of like style. So yeah, I mean, there are people, like some beginners are doing five miles a week of run and walk, and but they're still doing as much as they can and they feel the same pain, um, <laughs> discomfort, you know, they poop themselves, like whatever. <laughs> um, and so, I mean, to us, like the training varies, but the coaching doesn't. And sometimes even the workouts are similar. So we had some swap athletes over for Thanksgiving and everyone was talking about this one, like eight, six, four, two minute workout. And it was cool to see different runners at different levels share a similar workout and have a very similar approach to it as well. So while the mile, I'm coaching David right now. And so he did 94 miles last week. And so that's obviously very different from someone who's a recreational runner or someone who's more of a middle of the pack runner. But this, this same training philosophy applies as David was saying. Definitely. 94 miles last week, David? It's Thanksgiving. <laughs> I was just, you couldn't get that extra six? What the hell is yeah. wrong with you? <laughs> just no, they were actually, I was supposed to do less. I gotta be honest. Yeah. It was like a couple extra. Well, then he was running with me and I'm his coach. So I'm like, well, you can, you can do those extra three miles. Yeah. <laughs> and like if I bat my eyelashes really pretty, maybe I can get an extra six. <laughs> can I have an extra six? I mean, you know you're having fun <laughs> when you're begging for extra miles. So. Here's a thing. Old, extra miles. <laughs> yeah, I'm just saying. Uh, so sure. Let's start getting into this here. So I'm I'm super curious. You uh, obviously have a number of athletes of all different abilities. We just talked about that, but the holidays I I tend to see influence different runners in different ways because some have families, some have work schedules, uh, some have the freedom to go explore and adventure all they want through the months of November, December, January. What is the, do you have uh, like a most common uh, worry amongst your athletes of how am I going to get my training in or do I need to pick my races now? Or like, what's the most common worry amongst your athletes that you see going into this holiday season? Well, I think the, the big one for me right off the start is that you don't need to be pushing your, like the boundaries all year long. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's okay not to be in peak shape at any given point. The key is to try to avoid like completely falling off the wagon and losing sight of what brings you purpose in the process you love during this time of year. So it's especially hard for people with families, but our main goal is to help an athlete set up a framework so that this time of year feels really purposeful and you don't get in those like negative feedback loops that can really happen in the holidays. So like a good example being, um, you know, 10 minutes counts, like you guys have both probably heard me say this, where, 
you know, if a run's planned, you don't have to do the whole thing. Just get out and like run a little bit um, if you can. And then if you can't, that's okay too. Just remember that each day is an independent variable. So just because you didn't run today doesn't mean that you're worthless and you can't run tomorrow. It's like, no, no, it doesn't matter. You're just, just start over. Everything's great. Even if you don't run a week or two or whatever. I think kind of going off that too is that investing in your health. So I think sometimes during the holiday season, things can be chaos, like money is all over the place, you're buying gifts for people. But I think thinking about your general health and making time for yourself. So even if investing in your health is just like a 15 minute session to meditate and get away from the day and just making sure it's, it's okay to prioritize your own, your own self. And um, if that self is going to go be a kinder person to people, that extra 15 minutes can make a big difference. And so I think just saying that it's okay to do that and it's okay to step away from the chaos and make time for yourself this time of year it tends to it seems like a decent time to take an off season to to take time away do you schedule that into to your athlete schedules like let's just cool down for two weeks during you know the christmas two week bust where you have new year's eve and all that stuff or do you do you just lighten the load i mean do you how, what sort of effort do you guys make to make it easier on your clients i guess so it's heavily dependent on the individual but our general principle with off, and this gets back to off season philosophy in general, which varies a ton and nothing is wrong. So, or right. So, um, if, if this is different than the way you do it, it's totally great. But what we, I mean, what we generally try to remind athletes is that in training, you shouldn't interpolate from outliers. So a good example of an outlier is a professional athlete like Killian Jornet, um, who famously doesn't run all winter, just does skiing and right. plays in the mountains. Then comes back and beats everyone. In the old days, everyone said Killian's the best because of schemo. And then more recently, last year, he had a compound fracture in his leg, couldn't even do that, still came back and won every race in the in the world right after. Off of crutching intervals. It was yeah, amazing. Yeah, right. yeah. Yeah. It's unbelievable. But like uh, then I think it's important to think, well, what would happen to me if I did the same thing? And for most of us, like we'd come back and be like, oh crap, I can't, I'm like a beach whale. I can't even move. Um, so in other words, like these full shutdown off seasons might be counterproductive for some people, unless there's a major burnout episode going on. Right. So we like athletes to do is focus on a weakness or focus on something that streamlines their lives a little bit. The usual swap approach to some work called player athletes is to use the off season to really emphasize development of speed. Um, no one's really doing ultra races right now or really long races. It's a great time to get good at 5Ks and 10Ks or miles or anything like that. You can do it at lower volume. It's really fun. Um, and that fitness, that running economy, will then distribute to longer races later. So um, we do that. I mean, the pros, like last year, Keely Henninger, Claire Gallagher, Jason Schlar were all in peak 5K shape by February and March and then had great years. Um, but you know, some people need to shut down a little bit more. I like doing the off season too, as a celebration of training. So, you know, you've earned an off season. If you're taking an off season, you've worked hard. You've maybe you've raced hard. Maybe you've trained hard. Maybe it's just the right time. So I like athletes doing things that they enjoy during the off season and making it a celebration as opposed to something they're taking their own medicine. So it makes me think I have an athlete right now who is ballroom dancing every other day. So awesome. she's. Off season is like, you know, Monday ballroom dancing, Tuesday, four miles, Monday, Wednesday um, ballroom dancing, Thursday, four miles. And I thought that was a great approach in terms of just keeping things lighthearted and fun. And that's how you're going to recover too. Um, you know, if you're dreading it, your body's not going to recover as well. Yeah. And I mean, that gets like the whole point is to love the process, like whether it's ballroom dancing or running. And we never want an athlete. I mean, hopefully if an athlete's with us, like they never feel like I just don't want to run right now for like a month. You know, it, right. it's if they think that we failed, not them. Like the, as coaches, like we're not directing them in the right way to think about their running so that it's something they want to do. Maybe not every day, but often. I mean, I, I don't know if I'm probably shouldn't use examples from you guys, but Kim being a great example, I told Kim to do very little last week. And I found that like the, the 20 or 30 minute jogs became our runs, you know, and it, it wasn't because she was, I mean, Kim was always owns it, but it was because she loved it. She wanted to be out there. Um, and to me, that's the dream as a coach, like yeah. someone that wants to do it so much that the gift isn't the absence of it. It's the presence of it. Yeah. Um, but it's complicated for sure. And so I think the big deal or the big thing is like cut your, cut yourself slack always, but especially in winter and holidays, like never beat yourself up about anything. 
Um, like it really gets back to that you are perfect no matter what. And sometimes like, you know, run intervals are better replaced by eggnog intervals anyway. It, I, I'm go ahead. I was gonna say Caroline in the chat room has a great point. Having less running last week gave me an opportunity to get my hair cut. <laughs> <laughs> it works out. Say, but I will say, like during that, like my the low week that I had, there was a lot of uh, me going. Well, how come you get to do blah blah blah? Right. <laughs> <laughs> I figured it out. It was fine. It, it's it was totally fine. fine. <laughs> uh, I do. I mean, of course, I do want to say that uh, many of our viewers may not have coaches, may not even be interested in coaching, and I. Believe me, I'm with you. I spent years of my running career not having a coach and right. uh, totally embrace that as well. So I don't want anyone to think that, you know, when we bring a coach on that you have to get a coach or any of that sort of thing. Uh, the reason I love David and Megan is that they, they have so much insight and they're so willing to give um, that if, if tonight is the night that you're watching and you have questions for a running coach but have no interest in one, ask them in the chat room because it's a great opportunity to pick the brains of two really great ones who do coach elites all the way down the back of the Packers. It's all about the joy. And it's all about the, uh, the fun. Um, yeah, and we're firm believers. We're firm believers that like coaching is one of those, it's, it's a high, it's a relationship, right? right. And you, you want to opt into relationships and have it be a big thing. Like you, you can totally self coach. Um, like that's, it can be a really fulfilling way to do it. Um, so we're not one of those people that's like, you need to have a coach. It's like some people, benefit from it um but others get a ton of like personal fulfillment out of doing their own thing um but i think it is important to remember you are like if you don't have a coach you are your own coach so like to give yourself that credit and really own it because um yeah if you just are like well i don't have a coach i just kind of do whatever it's like well then your coach just has you doing whatever <laughs> yeah uh, we do have lots of live questions. Kim, Kim's already pulled a, a bunch aside, live, so let's get to some questions. of these. Uh, yeah, a question from Josh in the chat room. Josh asked, how much do you listen to the athletes' wants versus what they what they as a coach thinks be think is best? <laughs> Sorry. That's a really good question. I think it, it kind of goes with how crazy the wants are. <laughs> and so my general philosophy is that if you're enjoying something, and there's lots of great studies about this, that you're going to adapt to it better. Um, so for me, I'm not going to give someone a like a, a hard cross training workout if that's not what's going to stoke their fire. And so a lot of it is about understanding the athlete and developing a relationship with them and understanding their point of view and how, <laughs> you know, their perspective on this. But generally we do kind of, we understand that if an athlete wants something, it's kind of, we, we try to work it in within reason. We yeah. have some, we have some really ambitious athletes. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of gets back to that, like R. Kelly song, Bump and Grind, you know, where it's like, my mind's telling me no, but my body's telling me yes. Usually it's like the other way around. Their mind's telling them yes to something like, you know, some athlete will be like, I want to run 40 miles in the snow with 15,000 feet of gain. And we're like, we're the ones being like, um, maybe let's go do 10 miles and then like if it's change. something really crazy, I often ask, ask athletes to write me a little essay. I'm like, yeah. explain to me all the reasons why you want yeah. to do this. And sometimes it's like extremely yeah. meaningful. And I'm like, you should go do that, um, particularly for 100 mile races. But if they are if they come back and they're like, well, gee, I don't know, then it's it's you know a good point to say this is probably not a good idea. Yeah, and that gets back to our book. Like, there's a whole chapter in the book about knowing your why. And I think like there is no why that is the right answer, right? So our what we ask athletes is that heavily internal and positive like it's not judged by success failure external mo metrics things like that right. if it means that, then, you know go for it write me a persuasive essay yeah, yeah. i'll take it five paragraphs <laughs> satisfy dr megan we're in i mean i i think just even talking about the why and Kim and I have talked about this numerous times with our races. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be, uh, you know, we, we talk a lot about what's your what's your deep seated why. It doesn't always have to be that. It doesn't always have to be this like because I need to get back in touch with this this childhood thing and this is where it needs to happen. You know, it doesn't need to be this big extravagant thing. It can be a simple why, like I want to prove to myself that I can do this. Or you know, you I know that you talk about it in your book, but. I just love the idea that it can be something that you, it just has to be something that you draw from in those moments of uh, lows, like lows in a race. You're going to need to find that seed that you can dig, you know, dig into. Um, and that could be anything for any any person, really. Right. Uh, go ahead, Kim. Sorry, you had lots of questions there. I do have lots of questions. Um, great question from Connor regarding the holidays. Connor asks, with the That's holidays. 
With the holidays that are heavy on indulgence and whatnot, how do you balance productive training with sitting in front of the fireplace? This is this is kind of my problem, which is <laughs> it's like it's cozy weather out here. Yeah. I want to nestle uh, on the couch, the, like, snacks, just, just eat and gorge. How do you, how do you find that balance? Well, first, <laughs> I mean, eat and gorge and drink and all that stuff. Just do it after you run, if possible. <laughs> Or at least leave three hours before you run. Um, I mean, we're we're huge. Like we're the biggest fans of food ever. Um, like the only person that beats us is Addy Dog. And um, with that in mind, like we don't think restriction is ever a good idea. That being said, like you know, um, gluttony is also probably not super healthy. Um, so it's about striking that balance. But we're big fan. Like with our athletes, we're like, look, don't worry about all anything like participate in the festivities, like, um, eat everything, like do what is really fun for you. Try to like balance things as much as you can. But if you don't, that's fine too. Like, don't feel like you need to burn it off or whatever. If you end up like gaining some weight, that's totally fine. Um, you know, it gets back to like, that's part of the process too. And it's probably pretty healthy, Mm -hmm. um, time of year to go in those fluctuations. So yeah, cut yourself some slack enjoy some eggnog or turkey. The way I like thinking about it too is that these holidays are pretty short in terms of the duration of a long right. training cycle. And so missing one day on Thanksgiving or you know taking off on Christmas morning or Hanukkah evening, it does it literally does not make a difference in the grand scheme of things. And in fact, you might even be better for it. It might be a blessing in disguise. And so kind of thinking about it in that mindset and that's when it's hel- it can be helpful to plan it out and be like, I know today is a rest day on Thanksgiving and I'm going to enjoy it to the heck of it. Um, and so I think that can be a really helpful too. Yeah, but never, never say no to like a serving also, of ice cream or something. I had an athlete who ran after Thanksgiving dinner, and I was like, "That is one of the most impressive things I have <laughs> ever heard in my life." Like, but never do that again. Yeah, yeah. That's how horrible. Never ever do that again. <laughs> I was like, after the meal. I mean, it's one thing to do the turkey trot or something in the morning. I'm like, I get that. That's that's dedication because that whole day is usually travel and family. But to do it after dinner, I'm surprised they wouldn't lose half that dinner on the I, run. <laughs> I was like, well, first of all, I was like, that's an ultra training. If you can eat a Thanksgiving dinner and yes. run a good run, you're going to do really well in the ultra world. This actually reminds me of my first, one of our first dates. I met Megan's family. And so this was like eight years ago. And I was just, I was totally in over my head. But to get an idea of like the family I was going in, we, it was New Year's Eve. Um, and we had like this big dinner. And then they're like, oh, we're going to go run a 5K at midnight as the ball drops in Philadelphia. We had drank wine, like oh glasses of wine. <laughs> More of a lightweight then than I am now. And yeah, of course, Megan. So we get to the start line. And of course, we're in evening wear. Like, so I'm going to, because it, long story, but it was like a race that had like props for that. Megan's in this beautiful dress and running shoes. And we get to the line. And we, we sit down and I'm like, you know, this is really chill. I go in to try to give Megan a kiss. And she looks at me and just goes, <laughs> It wasn't like that. It did not look like that. It was exactly It was more like, like we're about to race. No, no. It was a guttural growl that no. came from deep within her soul. And let me know that a kiss it was not It was speaking. Yeah. Uh, and of course, ran like 17 and won a lot of money for us. But... <laughs> Um, yeah, so don't do that at home. Like, yeah. once, you, <laughs> once you have dinner, the day is over. <laughs> uh, let's get to one of those live questions. Uh, yeah, a question from Deb. Deb asks, recommendations to runners that have guilt on taking days off. So I think I think it gets back to scheduling them. So I have, and David, the same way, we have most of our athletes take one rest day a week just because it's the best we found in terms of injury prevention, longevity, and consistency. And I think understanding that rest days are essential for performance is a great start um, because everyone's motivated motivated by performance. And then the other thing is having it scheduled as nice, kind of a similar concept with Thanksgiving. And we call them treat yourself days or treat your friends days. So either do something nice for yourself or actively make a commitment to do something nice for other people mm-hmm. and having that structure in the rest day, I find is really helpful. Yeah. And like also thinking of them as adaptation. Uh, as opposed to rest, like it's like I might not need rest, but my body always wants to adapt. Um, and as weird as it's like, so you know, there's a lot of different ways you can do it. But a good example is think of someone on that we coach, like Jason Slar. Jason Slar never took a long off season last year, but I think I counted it up, and he took 62 rest days um, so far this year without ever having an injury. 
Um, so they were just rest days by choice without really any particular reason to take them. Like there was no off season. We were about to do that after his race this coming weekend. Um, and you know, he won one of the like tons of races in one run rabbit run. And, um, that goes for Keely Henninger, Claire Gallagher, Kat Bradley. I, I mean the whole group. And so, um, that's not to say like, that's the most important thing every week, but like, I mean, you guys probably know, I, I'll often tell athletes, this is the most important day by far. Um, the other days, like, yeah, we can do that. But the, the rest days, treat yourself for that, but also then just like try to spread as much. I think it's better with time. The first day they suck the first time you take one and then you get yeah. used to it. I'm in a rest day right now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think you have a scheduled on Mondays as rest days and which is always good because mm. Ginger Runner Live yeah. tends to take up some of the day and it's, I love, I look forward to the Mondays, not because, oh, I'm not running. Like, you know, it's because I know what it's doing. I know that it's like a positive impact on my body to long runs over the course of the weekend or whatever your last week. Uh, like two weekends ago, the North Face weekend, mm -hmm. we kind of changed up our schedule and did something fun, like a fun adventure. But it had a ton of vertical gain for us in a very short amount of mileage. And I felt that this weekend. I felt that workout last week, this weekend. And so today is wonderful because I know that today is actually recovering from almost two weekends ago. Uh, I don't know. I, I enjoy those days off. I know that I was even talking to a friend who took like two weeks off and she was uh, really worried. She's like, I, I don't know. I, I had all these obligations and I just feel like I'm going to get back to running and it's going to be bad. And I was like, actually, two weeks off probably is OK. I mean, you get back to it pretty quickly, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, a great example from this past year is um, before checking out 50K. So Keely Henninger, two weeks before, had a pain in her foot. And um, it migrated to her shin. And I was kind of panicked. She, she's brilliant. Keely is a brilliant person, got in to see a doctor, and found out she had an infection. So she, she, she didn't run for five days, so from 10 days out to five days out or something like that, which, I mean, most people would assume, like, that will sabotage an elite runner at that level's performance. Um, and not only did it not sabotage it, she ran the second fastest time ever in like an extremely competitive race. And yep. so, um, you know, it just gets back to like, you lose a lot less than you think in any amount of time off. It's so much easier to get back where you were than to, um, get to the percent. In fact, short breaks make you stronger. And then, I mean, I think the, the other part is it's okay to like, you know, feel a little down mentally sometimes on those days and to fully embrace that too. Like not to be like, okay, I need to be happy because it's my rest day or whatever. It's like, okay, I might be lacking this, this shot of endorphins. And, um, if I'm a little bit more lethargic and whatever, it's like, that's okay. Yeah. Just, you know, have a, <laughs> hopefully have a good partner well, think, for your podcast. I think it's recording. important because like we all don't do, we have other things about ourselves outside of running. And so I think rest days and breaks are important in defining those elements about yourself outside of running. So I had a long break from running for injury and I taught myself how to cook, which was like, this was like a miracle of all horses <laughs> coming. To like I was like, you know, like the, the egg waffle on toast girl. And so, like, you know, breaks from running can be great opportunities to do other things in life too. Absolutely. Uh, it's great advice. Um, get to some of these live questions because I know Kim, you've just been like, there's a lot of live questions. Yeah, it's great. A uh, question from Vivian in the chat room. Vivian asked, uh, how do you stay motivated when people do not believe in your abilities or strengths and try and talk you out of your dreams? Hmm. Oh my gosh. Well, Vivian, those people are wrong. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, I mean, I think we all have this, 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 whether that voice is coming from inside our own head or from the outside. And um, there, there will always be doubters in, in what we think or, or want to accomplish. And, you know, the only um, vaccine against that, the only antidote to that is resilient, stubborn self-belief. Um, because all of us, no matter who we are, will be shown that, like, we'll, we'll face down times, we'll be shown over and over again that, oh, wait, are you sure you actually should believe in that? Are you actually capable of that? Like, a pro runner that fails or a first-time runner that gets injured or what anything in between. Mm. Um, and so in the face of that, you just need a strong grounding in like believing in yourself and not internalizing comments from others or over-internalizing your own self-critical thoughts. Um, where that comes from is highly individual. Um, but, you know, I think we're the only real like sustainable place is from pure, like from self-acceptance. And so what like self-acceptance and self-belief doesn't mean thinking you're going to win a gold medal. 
Um, you don't need to think you're going to be the best in the world. You just need to be able to hold on to a love of self, even when you're handed evidence to the contrary, that you might not be like capable of something. And if you're able to do that, you'll find that you're capable of so much more than you could have ever dreamed. Um, yeah. I also think that people don't really care about as much as you think they do, um, which can be a really powerful thing because you know you might you might be building up these thoughts about how people are doubting you or hating you or you you know um, you know just not rooting for you overall, but they truly don't care, and that's a powerful right. thing. About it. You know, people are busy. They care about themselves. They've got a lot going on. And so when you think about it that way, it gives you the chance to take risks on yourself and, you know, not to put that extra self imposed pressure on yourself, too. Yeah. And so, like Vivian and everyone else, you're freaking awesome. Like, don't, you know, there's no reason to ever put like any other thought on what you're capable of than that. Because even if you're not able to do whatever humongous dream you have, it's not that important. You know, it's life in a bite-sized morsel that we could consume without that much downside. So consume away, you know, have fun with it. Indulge in your beliefs, in yourself. And if you can do that, like you might find this massive reservoir of potential in yourself long-term. Um, and then as it relates to like specific people that might doubt you, I mean, haters gonna hate no matter what you do. Like we often, we, we talk about that in the book a little bit. And we talk about that to each other. Like, you know, we try to, like this, this stuff where we try to like puppy enthusiasm, all these cliches we throw out there. I mean, it's a choice we've made over time to be like this. And so we've tried to like live like a puppy as crazy and you know simplistic as that sounds, even with the knowledge that there's a lot of people that hate dogs. Like actually this, so last time we were on Ginger and Alive, I went back through and was like watching it. And someone on the chat screen was like, Addy dog is so distracting. Get her out of there. They'd be so much better without Addy dog. And yeah. I was like, well, I'm not listening to that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm surprised that comment would come across. Normally our viewers are very dog pro, like pro dog. You know, but there's always going to be, you know, 2% of people who don't like right. dogs, who don't like enthusiasm. And so it's important not to cater yourself to that. And I still love that person. Like, yeah. you know, they've just probably never been exposed to dogs before. And I get it. Yeah, yeah. And like to, you know, like not to, as much as I'm saying these things of like, haters going to hate all that, um, you know, to instead of responding to that with like resentment or other emotions that are negative, respond to hate with love. Um, like, you know, the, when they go low, we go high thing. There's right. so much truth to that in terms of lifting yourself up, but also lifting other people up. Almost everyone that doubts you or your worst enemy is driven by the same insecurities that you might feel. Um, and that brings us together in a way that like, we're all on the same team. People might not realize that right away, but like eventually they might. And, um, yeah. So like if you, if you can try to keep that love, then you can find yourself belief. Then you can find what you're capable of. If you find, if you're like driven by hate, it's like Darth Vader in the dark side. Like eventually you're chopping off people's heads. That was I mean, deep. I, <laughs> <laughs> I feel, I, I feel like that in itself is it. Vader, that's when you know you're like doing well. Thanks. <laughs> I didn't uh, have before Megan. <laughs> I was just going to say that I feel like that is also a topic that we could do on an entirely different show because when we started Ginger Runner years and years ago, almost, I mean, almost eight years ago now, it's been full of hate throughout the entire process. As much as it's been a positive experience and we show a lot of the positives and a lot of we do our best to show the highs and lows of running and going through, you know, races or experiences, training, all that, showing the highs and lows. There's this whole, you know, backside of, of being online personalities that there is a lot of hate and there's a lot of ways that you can look at that. You can either let it get to you or you can not. And it is it is the hardest thing to let it not. Uh, but I also think that translates to, to, to beyond the Internet. So people in your life and, and people around you, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to tell you. You can't do things. You shouldn't be doing this. It's going to, mm -hmm. I mean, as basic as that's going to hurt your knees, uh, you know, that sort of thing when you, when you talk about ultra running. But there's lots of ways that you can look at that. You can absorb it and believe it, or you can believe yourself and believe your heart and believe your mind and follow what you truly believe, which is this is healthy for me, for my mind or for my body. And um, I don't know, that, that could be a whole topic for another show and a chapter for the book. Uh, I know you guys dabble a little bit in that. For sure. So YouTube, YouTube comment sections could be a nice. Uh, we could do a we could do a dramatic reading of YouTube <laughs> comment sections 
on Ginger on Your Eye videos and illustrate the point, I'm sure. Or people who have, you know, hated on our coaching or, you know, oh, yeah, somewhere called like Swap. Yeah, we, had we, we get early on, all the time. Yeah. Especially early on. You know, now I think people are a little less... Well, we still get it. We still get it, but we don't hear as, <laughs> we don't hear as much of it now. In the beginning, you know, you're, you're really sensitive to it. Yeah. And I think that's kind of like a runner that's a little less sure of themselves where, like, you're you're more sensitive to the things that might be said critically about you or implied critically or whatever and um yeah so it's not that you don't want to you don't want to ignore things because it's real right like you feel that emotion um but you just don't want to try to you don't ever want those things to bottle up and cater to it because if you cater to criticism you're just going to produce self-critical crap whether that's a podcast or your own running or your life um so yeah, you do you because you're perfect. Uh, thank you, David. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's talking to everyone. Are you oh. just staring into his eyes? Oh, the whole I time? thought he was. I thought he was just talking to me. I was. <laughs> wow, I was blushing. Oof, uh, oof this is embarrassing because uh, we are live. Uh, let's delete those comments in the chat room that are popping up there. Um, let's get to another live question. Yeah, a question from Snowman in the chat room. They asked, "Do you find using social media useful for training? Is it helpful or harmful?" For your thoughts during training, example, looking for kudos after a tough run when you get down on yourself. A similarly dovetailed conversation drink. Yeah. So, I mean, I think all this stuff is the same thing that is positive can be negative. Um, so the risk with social media is that it's a tool for self-judgment where you're evaluating yourself through external, external metrics, um, whether that's like a person giving you kudos or just being like, you know, this doesn't have meaning without that validation. And everything in life that is driven from that point is a slippery slope to self-loathing. It doesn't matter, even if it starts positive, like, oh, yeah, people are going to love this run. Look at this. Eventually, you're going to be in a slight, your inflection point is going to turn. And when, when that happens, like, the same thing that was driving you before will sabotage you now. Um, so in the face of that, I love social media personally. I mean, like, I'm, I'm sure there's some of our amazing swap athletes and like we really utilize social media for our athletes, but it just has to be a place where you derive support and internal incentive structures, not like trying to cater to other people. Um, and I think there's a few reasons like we just talked about. I think the other is that other people like as a whole have the memory of like fruit flies and um, you're never going to satisfy the crowd for very long. I mean, we've coached some athletes that have won, you know, Western States and world championships and things like that. And they win. And like the first question is, what are you doing next? Like they don't race for a month. It's like, well, how do you feel like you're getting past, spot? you know what I mean? Um, so there is nothing that satisfies the peanut gallery that cares about like performance, you know, instead try to draw into the people that value like that process of it as much as possible. And if you do that, social media can be the most uplifting thing in the world. Instead of just being connected to the people that you know and you, you like know personally, you're connected to thousands of amazing humans that are right there along for you and like can cheer on your haircut and your eyes. <laughs> oh, it's deep. I'm gonna add something a little bit less deep than that. Oh probably still important, is that the value of social media is that you can choose, you opt into it. Um, and so for me, I had gotten to a point a couple years ago where I was frustrated with social media. And so I rectified that situation by following um, puppies, babies, and llamas on Instagram. And so now when I scroll through my feed, it's like things that my bothered me or things that upset me. And then it's like puppy, baby, mama. And it's like, it's amazing what a difference that makes. And I've done the same thing on Twitter. I follow comedians. I feel like having things in there that kind of break up the social media have been really helpful for me. And then the final little point on that is instead of just thinking about it, I was, my question answer was from the outside. Megan's was more from the inside, but even more than that, try to view everyone as a member of your team. So like, I mean, we all face these, these crises, right? Like you see someone post something on Facebook and a little bit of your monkey brain is jumping up from like the very rear of your brainstem. And it's like, that person, I'm jealous of them. I, you know, they're taking like the resources that I have, you know, whether someone has a good race or something, it's like, try to quiet that down and be like, okay, I'm rooting for everyone. Um, because if you do that, oh my God, social media can be so uplifting because everyone's success is your success and everyone's failure, you know, you're lifting them up too. So, um, it can be this place of like communal success stories and joy and development over time and depression and all the, all the stuff that make a whole life. Or it can be like just another place to be like 
<laughs> monkeys fighting for food, and that's no fun. Or llamas. <laughs> I love that it's puppies, babies, and llamas. Because yeah, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. think for us, it's puppies. I just said I want to spend some time with llamas. You, <laughs> There's like a segment on the news about, about llamas. About an hour ago, Kim's like, I want to spend time with llamas. And I was like, this is an odd sentence, uh, but also, what happened to otters? I thought otters was eh, either. still there. Either. Yeah. Uh, total side. Oh, <laughs> oh speaking of <laughs> land otters. <laughs> you can tell oh. I'm wearing a nice shirt and exercise pants, so I should probably put that up. <laughs> That's like, usually us sitting at this desk. <laughs> yeah, uh, usually there's very little below the waist. Uh, tonight, <laughs> we both happen to be wearing pants. Uh, <laughs> what was that thing? Um, but a little side co- conversation, side tangent that made me think of uh, this was I was just telling you the other day, a friend of mine, Wheezy Waiter, he's a YouTube channel, YouTube personality. His name's Craig, but he goes by Wheezy Waiter. He's been on the, the platform for uh, over 10 years. He's one of the old school YouTubers, really fantastic creator, uh, lives in Chicago with his wife. But he and his wife, they just posted this video the other day. They took a month off of social media. They were finding that they were following down that rabbit hole of endless scrolling uh, because these platforms are designed to be a constant barrage of content. You're never going to end. You're going to scroll through Twitter until new content's available, and then you're going to go to the new content and scroll through that until new content. I mean, it's endless. Mm -hmm. So it's so easy to have negative pieces of content coming at you into your eyes and you're reading it and you're seeing it. Uh, and it's so much more difficult to pull yourself out of that endless cycle. They stepped away for 30 days and it took them a couple days before they, uh, I encourage you to go watch the video, just searching for wheezy waiter. Um, we'll, we'll pull it up, but they found after a couple of days that they enjoyed things more. They enjoyed going to bed and sleeping and waking up and being alert and being engaged in what's going on in everyday life uh, and surrounding themselves with actual people, real faces rather than profiles and pictures and that sort of thing. Uh, The things that they missed were the uplifting stories, the uplifting content that they would see on a day-to-day basis that would lighten their mood and that would make things better. Um, So yeah, it was a really interesting sort of study in how social media has kind of altered our joy just our level of joy in all things that we enjoy mm-hmm. you know and that can go from running and and I was watching it going this is kind of like a bigger topic but definitely applies to the sport of ultra running and running when you're constantly perusing Strava or social media and seeing pictures and that FOMO and it's so easy to get caught up in the negative side of things when the positives are just they're all around they're all around yeah I mean, I think one really important thing is, like, if you think about a normal running community, like, it's a certain, a few dozen people or whatever. And if you think about the whole running community, it's this massive group of thousands of people. And that massive group of thousands of people inherently has more, like, resources, more love, more all these positive things to give out. It also has more negative things to give out, too. But so does the local running community. And just because you're, you know what I mean? So... Um, I think everything's magnified on social media. Sure. That doesn't make it bad um, or good. It just makes it more. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So you also have the chance to find your best friend that you never knew existed that wouldn't be down the down the street or the community, the Ginger Runner Live, the swap that you never could have ever had locally because it's just not possible. But you could also have like the YouTube comment sections of like people telling you you smell like musty socks and you suck. I haven't got that comment yet. I hope that's yeah, yeah. <laughs> God, that's awful. Uh, David's getting ready to. Uh... David's like, I can't wait to type later tonight. David yeah. has a couple accounts that are just troll accounts. I know yeah, it. It's, just, it's how I relax at night. Well, I got <laughs> thoughts right now, so I'm waiting for your comment. <laughs> I actually have a f- uh, couple friends who have that used to be what they did. They would create fake accounts and they would troll people, like not professionally, but that is they got they're high from doing that. And you hear these stories and you're like, you need to get new friends. Oh, I did. <laughs> I did. I am no longer brothers with my brother. Um, that is, it was not my brother, but it, you hear that and you go, I mean, I don't get it. I don't get the joy. They just had so much joy out of tearing people apart. Cause they didn't think it actually caused harm. The reality is it causes harm. <sighs> um, side topic. We're, we're going to kind of wrap up the main show here. Let's get to one last live question from our uh, live audience our live uh, studio audience don't say that again sorry 
A uh, question from Andrea in the chat room. Andrea asks, given that many are thinking of 2019 running goals, what's your approach to setting real realistic yet challenging goals? So, I mean, my main request is to dream really freaking big. Um, not necessarily saying you want to dream the longest distance you can or the hardest race you can, but to not constrain yourself by thinking that, like, you're only capable of so much. Like, challenge yourself. Who cares if you don't reach that? It, just by trying, you'll get so much further than you could ever imagine. And it'll be way more interesting and fun. Um, so that doesn't mean go to a hundred mile hour if you've never done one. It means like, okay, I want to go, I want to like do this 50K and love every second and like crush it. And you know, you might fall a little short of that, but that still can be this really uplifting thing. I mean, um, you know, a good example being Cat Bradley. Um, when in 2016, she had never really done, like she'd raced a lot of ultras, but never like crushed anything too much. And we were talking and she was like, oh yeah. I was like, oh, well dream big. I said the same thing around a similar time. And she's like, maybe I could win Western States. And <laughs> you know, she got into the Western States lottery. One out of 1100 people picked her to win in the I run far prediction contest. And she won. Um, that doesn't mean like anyone can win Western States or even cat. Like it was like a hundred percent chance, but you know, by dreaming that big, she made the impossible so much more real. And even if she had never won, even if she had finished last place, that journey was really uplifting and enriching for her. So yeah, I would say just like be okay, challenging yourself, be okay, failing. And then you'll be like surprised by some really big successes. I think that in addition to dreaming big too, also develop process goals and goals that are like, a little bit like more tangible and potentially easier to accomplish. I'm, I'm thinking like, I'm the type of person who loves having a to-do list and having like take out the trash, like, you know, like, you know, empty the dishwasher, like things that are very easily attainable and can be crossed off or things that you've already done. And you're like, Oh, I can write that and then cross it off. Um, but it's the same thing with setting goals. Like there's, you know, achieving goals is fun. And so having, goals that are process based, like I'm going to be the best person I can be today, or I'm going to try to do the little things in running that keep me healthy in the long term. Um, having those goals there can be rewarding because you can accomplish them. Then they also support the bigger goals too. So it's kind of, it's a fun process. Yeah. And combining those two, I would try to make sure your big goals in running and your big goals as a human overlap um, and get intertwined a lot. So like, I mean, I always, we challenge athletes to try to be like, the kindest person they can be yeah. to everyone and things like that. And that can be a part of your running too. And, you know, trying to fully incorporate that into your running life can give you this reserve of strength that just like makes you Superman. Um, and so yeah. super woman, super woman, super person, <laughs> super dog. <Sorry>. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it is always a joy to talk to you. T a joy. joy. Nine uh, percent. This beer oh, was. Is this 9%? Yeah, it's it's like deep right. Christmas <laughs> beer. So that was fun. Um, but it is always a joy to have you two on. I I just can't get enough of your positivity, and it helps. Uh, it really does help to just talk to people who have a really great perspective on things, and and to help kind of get us through those lows. So I I really appreciate it, and I know that your book. We rarely, rarely talk about things like products on this show, if at all. Um, in this case, this is one of those things where it's helped Kim and I immensely. And uh, they are not paying us. Both David and, and Megan are not. This is not a hashtag this ad. This is not a hashtag ad, uh, <laughs> which you would legally have to do. No hashtag it is. spawn. No spawn, nothing. <laughs> um, this is a full-on uh, – this is both Kim and myself just saying it is it's great. I, I think it applies to everybody. We are legitimately getting it as gifts for for family and friends. Uh, I hope they're not watching. Um, they, our family and friends will not be watching. They definitely <laughs> will not be watching. My mom is figuring out the internet. <laughs> uh, but please, David and Megan, can you let us know where they can get the book uh, and where we can follow you on social media? Because there's going to be residual questions. There's like 14 questions here that Kim has pulled aside. So let's get to that. Uh, Amazon is the best spot for the book. So the, um, the Happy Runner on Amazon, um, and it's got a Kindle too. So if you like, it says it doesn't come out till Thursday, but our publisher, it's already shipping. People are getting it on Thursday. So right. if you order now, like, there's probably gonna long story, but the earlier the better to make sure you get it before Christmas. Um, and in terms of other things, like always, you, you always feel free to email us. Um, our email is all over the internet. You can just like 
Google and find it. Um, even with questions that are un- like you don't want coaching, but you have coaching questions, like one-off type things, we love to just try to help however we can. Um, and we're very quick over email, I hope. So um, like always reach out, never hesitate, just because you're like, oh, I don't want a coach. Um, we always like, we love that interaction and it really brings us a lot of joy. Our website swap running has a link and you can email us there. Um, and then Addie is a great dog to follow on Instagram for daily joy. She is Addie does stuff on Instagram, which is, um, yeah, she's fun. And then also follow some puppies, some llamas and babies, babies, babies. Uh, that's, that's for us, but also for you. <laughs> Uh, this is not all that we have with uh, David and Megan. They're going to stick around for our post show um, for our Patreon supporters. So if you are not a Patreon supporter, consider it. it. It's literally as little as a dollar a month gets you access to all of our post shows, both live in real time and also archived. So you can go back and scroll through all of our episodes, see all of our guests, post show uh, activities, stuff like that. Uh, but you'll get access to all of the future ones, too, as long as you are a Patreon supporter. So consider that patreon.com slash the ginger runner. Am I forgetting anything? I don't think so. Um, Ginger Miss is coming up soon. The weekend of December 15th and 16th is Ginger Miss. This is our, ooh, is this our fourth Ginger Miss? Uh, it's up there. Four or five, fourth or fifth. I think. Yeah, so we've been doing Ginger Miss. Basically, it's a free uh, global participation event with huge prizes. We basically want to give back. It all started with both Kim and I wanting to give back to this incredible community that's given us so much. So we come up with some incredible prizes. Uh, I know that we've already pulled together some amazing prizes from big brands. Gear, last year, last couple of years, we've been giving away an incline trainer from Nordic Track, which is like a $5,000 Incline Usually trainer. race entries, gears, packs, all sorts of stuff. All sorts of stuff. Yeah, um, and it's free. And it's free. You don't have to pay to participate. Uh, it is just our way of giving back, and we would hope that you participate this year. Ginger Miss. 2018 is going to be pretty big. It's usually a running scavenger hunt. That's usually what we end up doing. We give you guys a list with surprise items. You accumulate points. We tally up the points and award the winners prizes. Uh, and there's also some bonus prizes too for people who don't accumulate all the points, but do other cute things uh so please keep your eyes peeled on all social media it'll be on instagram um at ethan newberry or twitter at the ginger runner both kim's social as well Mm -hmm. at mile long underscore legs on twitter Twitter. and kimberly dt on instagram and then also today is monday this is the last day of our cyber monday sale there's still a few things left in the store um gingerunnerstore.com yes go grab it uh it is literally the last sale that we'll probably have on these items um there's some grgr technical shirts available there's about 80 of those left different different sizes and the uh gus our dog gus, gus head uh fundraiser head wraps those are also available for five dollars off each so go grab those now it's at gingerrunnerstore.com that's that's pretty much our plug that helps us sustain this whole thing so consider it uh if you're looking for holiday gifts for friends or family I think that is it. I think that's it. Okay. So Patreon crew, we'll see you in just a couple of seconds with uh, David and Megan Roach. We're going to enjoy a little bit more question and answer period with them in a couple of bits. And 9% bits, beer. And 9% beer. Uh, thank you, everyone. I hope you had an amazing Thanksgiving if you live in the United States or just an amazing weekend if you live global. Uh, and we'll see you guys next week. This is We only have a couple more shows left of the year. I think three more shows. Three more shows. Yeah. And then we're on a bit of a hiatus and some fun stuff will occur. You'll see. Thank you, everyone. Get out there, train hard, race harder, and part of the hardest. We'll see you guys next week. Bye. Bye.